Hello, I'm Gemma Atkinson and welcome to The Petcast, brought to you by leading pet charity, Blue Cross. This episode is all about health and well-being. I remember thinking, I, I need this dog in my life. I think we're both going to save each other. And I think it was one of the best decisions that I've made in my life because she, she saved me. Strictly Come Dancing's Karen Hauer on the happiness her three dogs bring to her. To see how happy they are and how content they are to be at home, they've, they've changed our lives. Plus, Tracy Genova is Blue Cross's Head of Education Services. She'll be talking to me about how animals can help our mental and physical well-being and the role we have to play in looking after theirs. We have to get the right pet and we have to provide for all its needs. It's not all about our well-being, it's about theirs as well. And that's what we do on the Petcast. We have candid conversations around the big issues facing pet lovers like me and you, with some of the UK's leading pet experts on hand to give us their best tips, tricks and guidance. Uh, so Tracy, welcome to the pet cast. Um, what are the key benefits, in your opinion, of, of being a pet owner? Well, I think if you if you get the right pet for you, uh, they can bring us so much joy. Uh, they're really good for our mental well-being and for our physical well-being as well. And they can help with things like loneliness and self-esteem and all sorts of things. And I was reading that um, pet owners visit their GP less than those who don't have pets. Is that true? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, there was some research done and um, it's actually... Uh, Pet, pet owners go to their GP 10% less than people who don't have a pet. So, And the better you love your pet, you know, the better it is. So um, it will actually save a fortune on the NHS if everybody had a, had a really nice pet. Well, they do say they're the best medicine, aren't they? Like you say, mm. either a companionship or just comfort or, you know, they, they just want love and, and a bit of attention, don't they, and food. Um, <laughs> very, very simple but very, very rewarding creatures. And we did a, a hospital visit recently and there was a therapy dog on the ward mm. uh, used to basically it was to calm patients down before major operations it was so so sweet and one of the doctors said that apparently stroking a pet can actually help lower blood pressure mm. uh, in certain situations so that's why now they're having a lot of um they're allowing more animals in hospitals so to speak to calm patients down which i think is great yeah, and it's um, it lowers blood pressure in kids as well, in children. Um, and they've shown that um, in classrooms, they're more able to concentrate and their blood pressure is lower because there's a, an animal present. So it does actually keep us calm. And um, you remember, you have like fish in the waiting room at the dentist and that sort of stuff ah, as well. Yes. And that all helps. <laughs> I suppose it develops social skills as well in children. I mean, we got our first dog when I was two and my mum always says to me now it was a way of teaching me a responsibility almost mm. because feeding times I always helped. I used to help get the food. If we took her for a walk, I had to put a collar and lead on. Um, so I think for children it is not essential, but I, for me I think it's a, a great thing to have a pet in, a, in an environment where there's children because it, it does teach them things. It does, and like you say, um, it's it's all of that res those responsibilities. Um, I go into schools and we, we do talks to the children, um, and I said to him, "Who can turn on a tap and turn off a tap?" And I, yeah, okay, so you can actually make sure they've got enough water. And yet, a load of animals just don't have enough water. So it's something that children can learn really easily that they can be responsible. Uh, I do have a worry that sometimes parents say, "I'm getting this pet," and then the, it's the, for the children, then the children need to be responsible for it. Ultimately, it's the it's parents' responsibility. Help. It can be little helpers, can't yeah. they? Yeah, that's the main okay. thing. And obviously, we all know for physical health, pets are amazing. What about mental health? So um, yes, it, they, they're great for loneliness. For instance, um, they can uh, you know, they make a house a home. You go home and they greet you. Your cat or your dog will greet you. So that's a, that's a nice thing to do. Um, they can also help us relax, um, and they make us laugh. Yeah. And that's really good for our mental health, isn't it? To make uh, to make our, you know, make us laugh. So yeah, they can really help us um, in all sorts of times. It, you know, when we're low, they can lift our spirits. And it's a good community thing. Where I walk my local dogs, there's a sign on the lamppost and it says, every Sunday, any dog walkers, feel free to meet here at 10 o'clock and we all do a walk together. And until I moved to that area, I wasn't aware of that. Mm. So for me now, I have my regular kind of dog walking friends. People have the mum and dad friends or, you know, the school friends, whatever. Uh, so it, it is good to, to combat loneliness, I suppose. Yeah, I, I've not heard of that. That's such a nice idea, isn't it? Mm. I have heard of um, community cafes where people bring their dogs 
dogs once a week. So you go along with your dog. But if you haven't got a dog, but you just like the thought of meeting someone with a dog and, and saying hello. And so then it gets people talking. So it's just such a nice idea. Yeah. Well, Tracy, stay with us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we want to bring in our next guest, dog lover extraordinaire, who also happens to be an incredible dancer. You can see her on Strictly Come Dancing. It's Miss Karen Howard. Hello. Hello. Uh, now, Karen, you've got three dogs, haven't you? Yes, I Rescue do. Rescue dogs. Tell really? us about them. Well, um, I rescued um, Betty. So I have Betty, Marley and Phoebe. And um, they came from a foundation called Wild at Heart. Uh, Betty's from Bosnia. And I rescued her three years ago. And she was just a, a, a street dog. Um, we don't really know much about her past. But when I first saw a picture of her, she um, she was just sad. You can see the, the sadness in her eyes. And it literally broke me. Mm. And... Um, she she had concrete on her on her her fur mm. and she was just um you know not in a really good way and i remember at that time i was i was in a very good place and um i remember thinking i i need this dog in my life mm. i think we're both going to save each other and i think it was one of the best decisions that i've made in my life because she she saved me yeah. She absolutely saved me. And then from there um, came Marley. <laughs> <laughs> she got the book. Now, Marley, Marley is uh, of uh, the spotlight that, you know, he's the middle child. Yeah. He, you know, he's very, he's full of energy. And Marley, we adopted him when he was um, four months old. And he was left on, uh, he's from Greece. He was left on the side of an airport by the street in a box. Um, and a couple of young girls um, rescued them and took him to a shelter. Um, it was actually my boyfriend, David, who found him and he sent me a picture while I was in rehearsals for Strictly. Oh, no. And he's like, I think I think we need to have Marley. Marley needs a home. And I literally, I, I was like, let's get him. I didn't even, didn't even hesitate. Yeah. And, you know, finally, I mean, it's probably not going to be the last one. Um, it's Phoebe. We have Phoebe, who is also from Greece. And um, now Phoebe has three legs. Um, she... Um, she was in a. She was involved in a car accident. Uh, a car run ran her over. Actually, um, they left her to die on the side of the street, and um, so a couple of people found her and took her over to a vet. And um, they were going to put her down, but some people knew again the same people from Wild at Heart, and they uh, paid for her operation. And um, so now she is living here in London with mm. me, happy. She's nine months old now. And this dog is incredible. Three legs, nothing stops her. She runs wild of, on your she Instagram. Does. She like keeps up with the other two yes. as well. And what I love about them is that they're all from different country. Well, um, two from the same country, but different backgrounds. Um, I don't really know about their breed. They're just you know themselves. Um, they absolutely love one another, and they've they've helped me so much. You know, they've they give me even more purpose mm. and just to see how happy they are and how content they are to be at home and it makes you know I, I'm away on tour most of the times but my partner David is always with them and they've they've changed our lives that's what I was going to ask you about about well-being you know mental well-being of being a dog owner I mean for me when you see rescues they're so resilient and they've been through so much but when you when you tell the stories of where they came from but then you see them running around in your garden <laughs> you think they've just they're just forgiven and they've got a new lease of life yeah. and it kind of makes you think if if they can be like that y y I can do you know what I mean they yeah. kind of make you feel well for me anyway they make me feel happier yeah no and I've learned about compassion and kindness and relating to their emotions as well they they feel everything you feel mm. um when i first got betty i was i wasn't in a good place at all and she just her you know when i would be crying and not knowing what to do and stuff i would take her out for a walk and i'd feel already better and yeah. I'd do my exercises and then she would just roll on her side and, you know, while I was on the floor doing my downward dog, <laughs> trying to join <laughs> she in. was rolling in. Or even when I was crying, she was there for me to hug her. And mm. and that's the thing. It's it's something that emotionally, physically has helped me, you know, mm. and I, you know, and with the other two, I mean, they just make you laugh. When I come home, you just feel that energy, those tails wagging when you mm. come in. And there's no place, I mean, I love my job and I love being on tour, but 
there's no place I'd rather be than at home with my dogs. Yeah, I absolutely adore them. And why why was it important um, for yourself and David to have um, rescue dogs? Um, well, I grew up in Venezuela, and my mom had four Dobermans. Oh, wow. um, she, you know, she she had these dogs, and she absolutely adored them. And there was a little dog that she found that was a stray, and his name was was Benji, and he was my favorite little dog, and I absolutely adored him. Now Benji passed away, and at the time I didn't know. My mom had just told me that he had run away, um, but she didn't tell me that actually he was he was um, poisoned. Oh and uh, I only found out when she told me when I was fifteen, because um, I don't think she, I don't no. think I would, I would be, no. wouldn't have been able to handle horrendous. it as a kid. But I think that nowadays it's about, um, you know, there's so many dogs out there, so many dogs that are being maltreated, that are, you know, just, just that need rescuing because we need rescuing as well. Mm. You know, there there needs to be um, more awareness of, on how to take care of dogs. Um, on how to educate people of getting them, you know, fixed. And uh, and I think that's what's important for me is that so many of these beautiful animals are out there that just want to have a home and that want a family and that want to be loved. Yeah. And, um, you know, adopt, don't shop always. I mean... Mm-hmm. So many, so many of these puppy farms that are out there. Oh, it's horrendous. You it's, can buy them on the internet. Exactly, and it's, it's, it's awful. awful. And, you know, you can rescue puppies. You can rescue older dogs who also need love. Yeah. And, um, you know, sometimes they lose their owners as well. And, again, it's the joy that they bring. And, um, you know, making sure that you're, you're, you're keeping their... You're building a structure for them. Um, and that's what I love, I, I, you know, about having my dogs. They're very well behaved because I've... I've made You've it. Taught them, uh, yeah, yeah, I've taught them, and they're much happier because of that. They often say, don't they? You don't find a dog; a dog finds you. Yeah. And it's it's always the the, the thing. I think people you, you're on the fence whether or not you want to be that person who rescues or adopts. But once you have them, you think, what what did I do before? How did I cope <laughs> yeah. cope before they came along? And um, I wanted to ask you, Tracy. Obviously, Karen said um, her her pack is all rescue dogs. Yeah. Um, when I fell pregnant with my daughter, a lot of people used to say to me, what are you going to do with the dogs? Because mm. we have two. And I was like, what, what do you mean what am I going to do with them? We're all going to live together. Yeah. And a few people were like, Ooh, I don't know if I'd have dogs around a baby and it'd be too much. And for me, it was the last thing on my mind. It didn't even enter my mind, actually. There was no way I would give up on, on mm. my, my firstborn kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what do you recommend to people who are juggling you know, work commitments or in a situation where you know, they're expecting a child and you know, they, they're in love with their little dog or cat or mm. whatever and they don't want to part with it? So we've got lots of preparation because we've got at least uh, hopefully nine months that we've thought, oh, we've got a baby coming on. So we can get the animal used to what's going to happen. So it might be that your routine might change. It could be that, that there's going to be new furniture like a cot or a pram. Um, you can even buy or, or uh, download like noises like a baby's crying yeah, and, and you can start that. it yeah. short, small, like it'd be like five minutes. Start it quietly, and then build up to a, a bigger sound. Um, and then we've got some quite good advice on the Blue Cross website about what to do when you come home with your baby. So you come in the room without the baby and make a fuss of the dog because the dog's like you've yes. been away. <laughs> yeah, we did that, and we brought home a baby girl first. Oh, good so idea. So they could just smell her. That's a nice um, idea. And and the, when we came home. Um, we left Mia in another room, not on her, her own, obviously, she was with someone. <laughs> and I went and had 10, 15 minutes just playing with the boys mm. just because they'd missed yeah. me. And obviously they were wondering where I'd been. Uh, and then we slowly introduced her that way. And so far, it's, it's been amazing. They've yeah. taken to her so well. But I think, obviously, you know your dog's personality, don't you? I mean, did you ever have any fears, Karen, with um, with having three with how they get on or did, did did you just know you would help them anyway you'd get them to that well, stage well i mean i when it comes to getting you know having the decision of of rescuing i i i always just do it yeah and um but also it's it's about information and about the knowledge behind it so i always um research i have a lot of people that um you know my dog care he gave me good advice on how to introduce the dogs so i would take my dogs especially for example betty uh, my eldest, I would take her out, I would walk them out. Um, so they all um, are in a in a mutual 
area where they don't, she doesn't feel like she needs to fight for her territory. But yeah, just having the knowledge on, on what to do. And thankfully, there's plenty of places where I just Google things. But it's also my, it was my responsibility to make sure that bringing these dogs and rescuing them, that I was giving them a good place so that they were going to feel happy. So I had to make sure that I knew exactly what I was doing. So I was educating myself. And now I have such great puppies that are running around very happily. And um, But I think that's what's important, that sometimes people get dogs and they don't understand mm. that it's a big responsibility. Huge, isn't so it? So it's not just for to have somebody to play with. It's it's a partner. You know, you're getting a, a, a little partner that's going to be with you. Mm. So the more that you're knowledgeable and in what you're doing and how you're taking care of them, the happier and the, the great success you're going to see, you know, in how they behave and how they are around other people as well, which is really important for me. And obviously, um, Tracy, for mes- myself and Karen, mm-hmm. we're very active anyway. So we, it's a no brainer that we'll take our dogs out and yeah. on our days off, we'll go for hours in the park. And But for some people, just going outside is a big deal. You know, it, yeah. it takes a lot. And obviously, if they have an animal, they have to the exercise. What advice, like, how do we make sure that pets are getting the right amount of exercise to keep them fit and, and keep them mentally active. So I think what we were just saying about uh, getting the right one for you is really important to start with. So matching your your energy levels with the with the dogs or the horses' energy levels yeah. is, is really important. Um, but sometimes our situations change and the dog still stays very energetic yeah. and we can't, <laughs> we can't maybe go out as much. Um, so there's two things about um, dogs and exercise. There's the physical exercise exercise so they, they need walking at least twice a day um, and what that exercise involves does it involve some off lead time is it fetch you know how are we doing that maybe we need to consider a dog sitter uh, or maybe to take them for a walk but there's also the mental exercise so you can have a really high energy dog that actually would uh, you know in a working position like run around for eight hours a day and we can't be <laughs> all running around yeah. for eight hours a day but if you give them some mental stimulation they can actually wear themselves out mentally and have a sleep so they haven't had to run around all the time um, and I wish I'd known this lesson when I got my Springer who was very energetic yeah. <laughs> and just walking more and he got fitter um, <laughs> so but you can do things like have um, a, we call it a forage box you have a box and you have inside you've got cardboard uh, like tubes and little boxes you know your old recycling stuff put some kibble in it put a bit of shredded paper in and they, he's around you know, they're around trying to find yes. the treats and it's keeping them busy or those treat dispenser like balls with little holes in yeah. and they have to roll it around to get one treat but you know it's five minutes to get one treat so it's it's good so they're not getting over fat um, and also do look at their bodies and uh, their body condition because we you know dogs um, are all are meant to have a bit of a waste so so, yeah. <laughs> uh, and beware the the, uh, the fast dogs like the greyhounds because they always seem to have a waste even when they're overweight. So you do need to go, actually, I can just feel their ribs. That's okay yeah. too. So looking at all of those things and if necessary, take those steps to get the extra help in because you really don't want a high energy dog in your house that, that hasn't had enough exercise because no. they're going to play up. It, it, I suppose with the people who have cats, it's mm. in, a, in a way not harder for them because they're so independent you can feed them and when they could like we used to have next door's cat coming in our house and I used to feed it <laughs> and it, just because I, I, I thought oh it's cute and it was purring and stuff and next door you had to come around and say my cat's getting really overweight and I'm yeah. only feeding him twice a day is he coming in your garden and I said yeah I want to give him a little bit of ham and he was like you, you need to stop and he was going around all the houses this cat it wasn't yeah. just me he was going in number two six and ten cat. yeah <laughs> he was going around all the houses yeah. eating everything well we were feeding him um, but he just looked so adorable I thought I was doing a nice <laughs> yeah. thing for it but I clearly yeah. wasn't well if you want to hear something a bit gross about rabbits um, if rabbits get too overweight they, they get the sort of double chin especially the girls but they can't clean their bottoms because oh, they're too no. fat Bless. and if they don't clean their bottoms they get all mucky and then they can get maggots and all sorts of problems so yeah a slim rabbit is a happy rabbit <laughs> oh gosh definitely <laughs> it's actually funny because now having three dogs they all keep each other in shape yes. yeah because <laughs> yeah. they're running around in yeah. the garden and um and especially talking about weight especially for our phoebe who has three legs so the majority of the of the weight bearing mm. is on the front of the paw so i have to make sure that her diet is very um strict that I'm, you know, I'm very, you know, I give her enough um, exercise, but, and also what she's eating that's still enough um, 
calories for her to to be healthy but i have to make sure that i keep an eye on her weight all the time because you know if she yeah. gets too heavy then she won't be able to walk mm. properly and it'll affect her mm. that's yeah, true isn't it i suppose yeah. with three different ones yeah it's they're all individuals mm. and um, animals that are neutered uh, their metabolism will be slower mm. so they don't need as many calories and people think that having your, your, your bitch spayed makes her put on weight. It doesn't. It just means that she's not burning it off quite as much. Mm. And are there certain animals that, like, should be kept in pairs? You know, we were talking about mm. loneliness before. Is there certain animals that Blue Cross, that, you know, they won't rehome unless they're with a companion anyway? Yeah, so um, we, let's start with the dogs. Dogs do need play dates, so they need to be mixing with other dogs, even if you haven't got two. But they sort of tend to be part of your human pack, don't they? So they have that company. But um, rabbits... Um, we we have we like to be home rabbits in in twos at least because they can be very lonely and I can remember as a child and I loved my rabbits to bits as a child but they were on their own and actually they do need that company so a miserable rabbit doesn't play up and be naughty a miserable rabbit sits there quietly and just is very miserable Aww. so we do need rabbits and guinea pigs um, gerbils all need uh, other companions and rats as well the ones that don't uh, your Syrian hamsters they're the bigger ones the golden ones uh, they fight if you put them together. So, so <laughs> they, they, they need to live little... on their own. Personalities. <laughs> yeah. And they're nocturnal, aren't they, hamsters? Yes. Yeah, we always put them in the bedroom, don't we? Yes. <laughs> they run around on the wheel all night. Yeah, yeah I used to have, to, I had two hamsters, two gerbils. Um, and yeah, the hamsters, the at, at night, they used to come wide awake and then obviously sleep all day. So I, I could sleep through it, but my mum could hear it in the next room. <laughs> yes. She could hear him like nussling away, so she wasn't too happy about that. Yeah. But that's good though, that you take things like that into consideration, because mm. it's not something I thought of. I just thought if someone wanted to adopt or go and get a hamster, they could, mm. um, but I suppose that's where you guys come in with with the knowledge of things. It is, and and the other thing that people often get wrong with the, with the smaller pets is not giving them enough space. And in the wild, they would have so much more space than we're giving them. So um, you know, even your your gerbils, you think about adding extra tanks and bits to their enclosure, so they've got plenty to do. Otherwise, they just go stir crazy. That's why they tend to just do repetitive behaviour, like no 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 all night, and that's because they're you know mentally unwell. So we've got to think about their mental well-being too Aww. what do mental health issues look like in pets okay so you you do need to know your pet and know what is normal for your pet i think that's quite important because the species will manifest their their bad mental their poor mental health in different ways so um a dog it will be playing you up it will be it might be vocalising a lot more like barking a lot more it might be chewing things more digging stuff up just generally being annoying to you but what it's doing is just like I'm going mad here I need something else to do with my life so I said it might need more exercise or more mental stimulation or something like that um, with your cat um, often a, a nervous cat may spray in the house it'll spray around doorways and things because that's it's saying oh I don't like what's out there I'm, I'm worried so that's a mental health thing because he's anxious all the time Hmm. Um, animals that hide away are being anxious as well um, rabbits, miserable rabbits they, they just sit still quite a lot sometimes they over groom and lick themselves raw or, or pull out the fur so there's all sorts of things that you can see you're sort of building a picture of that's an unhappy animal yeah. and it's spotting those early signs I think and trying to make, you know, make it better for them because we, with our two, Norman and Ollie Ollie, that they're both I think they're very happy anyway but every evening, Ollie Norman likes to sit with us. Ollie likes to go and sit on his own. Hmm. Now, it's always on our bed, so I know it's, he thinks he's, it's his nest, so I know he's not going to slump somewhere. And I always go up and check on him, and as soon as I walk in, his tail wags. But he sometimes just likes to be, well, I think, just on his own for an hour or two, and whether it's to get away from us, Mia, or the, the other dog, I don't know. Would, would, is that something to worry about? or? I don't think it's something to worry about because he's quite calm. He's not going mm. away and hiding, is he? He's going away mm. to be he's sleepy. On his yeah. back, flat out, yeah. on, as if to say, yeah. this is my bed. Uh, and we yeah. have to physically roll him off to get in. <laughs> Anxious cats like to go up high. So if you ever go around a, a cat uh, rescue, we always have shelves up high because they feel safer up high. So that's a little All thing right. for cats. Yeah. Yeah, and your little pets, um, they, they might have repetitive behaviour. Sometimes they, they show them on like YouTube, oh, oh, look at this animal doing sort of a loop the loop a little hamster going backwards and forwards and then doing a little somersault. And, trauma. and actually it's, it's just its way of coping with a boring situation. Oh, mm. It's sad when you think of it like mm. that. 
But it's good that people are getting to know these these signs. And yeah. we spoke earlier about Karen was saying with her dogs, it's unconditional love. And mm. I, you know, humans, we do feel that. Do pets feel unconditional love? In your opinion, do you think that they have it? Well, I think yeah, we feel that unconditional love from them because um, they're not challenging us, are they? They're, they're going, you fed me. You're so wonderful. You fed me, um, and uh, they show how. Uh, they love us by trusting us. We can. Some of us will be able to get closer to our pets than uh, one pet than we could before because it was nervous before and now it trusts us. Um, they relax around us. They show quite soft eyes. Dogs and cats can show soft eyes. They're not staring as a threat. They're soft eyes and they'll only do that to somebody they trust. Um, cats might lick you or, or headbutt you and that's sort of getting us, their scent on us because they want us to feel part of their gang. So mm. there are ways and it, the more we know about those animals, and and read about them and find out about them and watch clips about them. Uh, actually, the more we can tell what they're saying to us. So that's a really nice thing to do to get to know your pet better. And Karen, with your with your rescues, did you find obviously Tracy was just saying they they'll they do certain things to show they trust. Did you have that straight away with them being rescues, or was it something you had to gain from them because of what they've maybe been through? Yeah, I mean, with my Betty, she would um, she was at first she would sleep by the door. So I don't know if it was something that she just wanted to get out, uh, maybe because she was so used to being outside. Um, so, and she's she's the type as well that likes her own time. She'll go under the bed, or she'll, um, you know, the other do- the other two are, are going crazy and you know play fighting, and she'll just sit on her corner or just sit by the door and or the window and watch, you know, the, the squirrels. Mm-hmm. Um, she's very calm, but at first I could see that she she was a bit, you know, she was trying to see if she could trust me yeah but i don't know what really happened to her before so but i needed to gain that trust and now she just roams around but i i see that i see that that's her personality now so it doesn't worry me the other two they were puppies so um they were a bit more they adjusted right away Mm -hmm. um and also because betty's so calm very calm and very assertive that she knows herself and it's almost like it, it rubbed off on the other two as well. She was the teacher as well. Yeah. <laughs> so we kind of just have to learn about what animal we, we want to spend time with, really, don't we? Learn about your pets and, you know, react to them accordingly. Mm, yeah. Um, sometimes a, a nervous animal, it's good to make yourself small, like squat down and talk to it rather than loom over it. And it's exactly the same with people, isn't it? Yeah. If somebody was worried, you wouldn't sort of loom over them, you'd sit down beside them. And it's those sort of little things, learning about how to, how to act towards them that uh, really helps us get on and I would I wanted to ask you personally just for for my information fireworks Mm. now obviously my two hate them um the like the shake the cry the literally try and go to the smallest place Mm. possible what advice would you give because I know that there's some that people have horses and you know what advice would you give around firework time so um with your pets in in your home um the thing would be to build them a little den within the home so it's interesting you say they want to go away into the smallest pace so if you've got um it could be a table and you drape a blanket over it and put their bed inside it mm. or if they've got a dog cage or something like that so somewhere that it's comfy and they feel that that's a safe area pull the curtains, turn up the telly. You can also have um, things that you can plug in. They're pheromones that um, make them feel more relaxed. Mm-hmm. Um, you you can um, also have sounds of fireworks and, and you start them off very quietly weeks before and build up that sound so they're getting used to the, the bangs. Um, yeah, so there's sort of, sort of a number of things we can do to help them. But it's a shame, isn't it, when, when they're nervous. And sometimes these fireworks mm-hmm. just come out of nowhere, don't yeah. they? Yeah, for a while, Norman wouldn't go outside. We had to like physically lift him onto the grass oh. for him to go to the toilet before taking him to bed because he just refused to go outside in fear mm. of because they can smell it in the air as well. I think. Mm. Um, yeah, so and I'm just remembering you can get a a, um, a a coat for dogs that you wrap around quite tight, and they feel it's on their pressure points and they feel like they're being uh, sort of cuddled, oh, so that nice. can help them as well. And before we go, I want to ask both of you: what would you say is the main message for someone who was considering getting a pet for their for their mental and physical well-being what would the the key message be like I, i'm all for it i think you know what would what would you both say uh, so uh, my main message would be they are great for our mental and physical well-being if that match is right we have to get the right pet and we have to provide for all its needs it's not all about our well-being it's about theirs as well 
Absolutely, I, I completely agree. It's about creating wellness for the entire family and yourself as well. If you have a happy dog, you have a happy family. <laughs> That's true. They say happy wife, yes. happy life, but I believe happy dog, happy, happy life. Ba- yes. yes. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, guys. It's been lovely to speak to you both, so thank you for coming in. Thank, thank you. you. That's it for this pet cast, but there's tons more information on our website, so head over to bluecross.org.uk forward slash podcast. Whether you've got a moggy or a mongrel, a Syrian hamster or shire horse, Blue Cross have got you covered. If you've enjoyed the episode, feel free to share it with a fellow pet lover or write us a review on your podcast app, which will help people find it more easily. I'm Gemma Atkinson. The Petcast is a Bengal media production for Blue Cross. <laughs>